variation, a variation of that. Yeah. I was talking in that. Uh, Do you think it's a baby? Do I need to like turn on the lamp just so you have backlight? Um, if there's a there's a light, there's like a light. Yeah, there's actual light that's right over here. I think they can read that. That would be right. Can't read that. The ones that had are. They're probably actually burnt out. Zero of my tax dollars at work. Paying this guy, I did light bulb. They didn't actually save 300000 on operating systems, they just don't replace light bulbs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Any, anyways. Hey. So, Kubernetes uh, or KDS for simplicity. Eight, yeah, because like the whole internationalization thing, yeah, replace eight letters with an eight, boom, done. Makes it easy. So we've got a fairly small group here. Uh, one of the reasons I didn't do slides is because I didn't want to like go too deep or too shallow for what you guys were at. So, what do you know about Kubernetes? Nothing. Nothing. I'm not allowed to answer questions tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the best. Ooh, there we go. We got something. We got something. He's a quick learner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't give him much credit. He'll take it to his head. <laughs> You two, anything? I've never used it. Okay. Um, I assume that it's the layer above Docker. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> All right. All right, so. Yeah. I get it now. Hey. Yeah, I didn't feel like wearing my Kubernetes one because I had this one on in the morning and I didn't change. <laughs> Boom, done. Um, okay, so. All right, Docker is great because. It takes and really kind of consolidates a lot of the issues that you get from the operational side of things and the development side of things. So if we kind of take a look at the consolidation and deployment of applications and systems uh, over time, traditionally it's you roll out a, uh, a server. So you go, you buy yourself a big hunk of hardware, you throw it in a rack somewhere, you install some software on it, you boot it up, and off you go. Which is great, it works, but you got a lot of problems because if you want a new server, now you've got to order yourself another big hunk of hardware, and you gotta have rack space for it, and you gotta have power for it, cooling for it, etc. cetera. It gets expensive, has long lead times, etc. So, introduce virtualization. And this is very high level and yeah, gonna fly over a lot, of, a lot of the detail, but virtualization lets us say, we've got one hunk of hardware, now let's throw 10 workloads on it, 20 workloads on it, 100 workloads on it. We can get crazy with this stuff. But when we virtualize, we effectively create a new emulation of the hardware layer underneath. So when we do a virtual machine, we emulate everything that a physical machine would be doing. We emulate a processor, we emulate memory, we emulate disks, et cetera. We run through the boot system, which behaves exactly like a physical machine, or at least that's the intent. Containers take that a step further. So now rather than emulating hardware, we effectively share the kernel out. So that means that rather than trying to emulate the boot process, and we emulate everything through the kernel initialization, and then your init processes, we only have to do stuff that's running in user space. So if you've got a web application, say Go, because Go is awesome and you should all be using Go if you're not using Go right now. Um, so if you have a Go app, you can run that. And so if you want to deploy a VM with it, you've got to start up your Linux, you've got to boot it, you've got to load the kernel, and the whole way down through, do your init process, and then you can launch your app. Containerization takes that and effectively runs one process. Now, you guys all have used Linux a lot, so you know that one process could be something like systemd. So that process can then fork and you can run a full on systemd uh, process in a container. It's a bit of an anti-pattern for the most part, but it can be done. So containerization now takes and abstracts a lot of the kind of underlying work that the boot process would have to do and makes one process that you have to start up. 
So rather than emulating an entire boot chain, you emulate the startup of a single application. So that leads to a lot of benefits. One, you're not replicating any kind of memory. So you're sharing the kernel, so you don't need to duplicate that. You don't need to duplicate your uh, init process. So whether you're running init D, systemd, however, uh, that process is gonna be pretty much what you've got. So because it's shared with containers, now you reduce your memory footprint. Your launch time is much shorter because now you're simply starting another process. And we still get a lot of the benefits because of a lot of the advances that companies like Google and Docker have done with isolation. So it does that through namespaces and C groups. You guys all familiar with namespaces and C groups? Okay. From before there was a dog. Fair enough. So LXC, C groups, etc., um, are kind of what Docker uses underneath. So Docker was effectively the flag bearer for that technology. They came in and they said, hey, all this stuff exists or is near existence. So let's take it across the line and let's make it easy for people. And that's where Docker really came in. So effectively, when you start up a process, um, and once again, very, very high level TLDR on this, but a C group namespace is your process off. So you can say, I'm going to use this network namespace, I'm going to use this disk namespace, I'm going to use this process namespace, and therefore you can allow the process to not be visible by other processes that are peer to it. So if you've got your main process at PID1 and it spawns off three things and each of those three are masked by different C groups, those three processes now can't see each other. So knowing that, we can kind of understand the basis of what a container is. It's literally just a process that's running on the system that's isolated from visibility to other processes. So we can emulate a system, we can run a single process, best practice here with running a container is typically run a single process that's narrow and run a lot of them. And you can take those processes and use them together and that's kind of where the Kubernetes comes into play. So Docker runs as a container engine and as a container runtime and as a registry. So there's a lot of pieces to Docker. But um, at the core of it, what we're focusing on for this piece is gonna be the Docker engine, which is what actually takes the container and runs it. So when you run a container, uh, if we break it down, the container is going to have uh, a bunch of metadata and a file system associated with it. So it's effectively gonna say, we've got these files that are necessary and here's what we do at launch. So when you launch the container, we're gonna start this process up by default. You can overload that stuff uh, that's all possible to do, but um, that, that's effectively all a container image is. Just a bunch of metadata and a file system that are associated. So our container runtime runs a process. That's the, the first piece. And Kubernetes comes in where we have a bunch of processes, we wanna coordinate them, we wanna make sure that things are running that are supposed to be running, things that aren't supposed to be running aren't running, and we wanna be able to coordinate across multiple nodes. So does that make sense to everybody, at least at a, a high level right now? Okay. So let's break down Kubernetes a little bit. Um, so we'll do, we effectively have two tiers. And so servers, I'll give these guys A's because each server runs an API. So the server here is going to, effectively each server runs three services. Assuming we want high availability, three servers is kind of your, uh, your, your magic number for a lot of that because you don't want one because that doesn't give you any HA. You don't want two because then you have no tiebreaker for a split brain scenario. So three is your magic number for, we want something HA, but without going overboard. So that's kind of the minimum number when you're dealing with HA systems distributed that you'll typically see. 
um, API servers each run the API server, they're all going to be active. Uh, they also will run a scheduler, and they will run a uh, controller manager prop, uh, process on them. Those guys are leader elected. That means that they're all going to vote, and one of them is going to be master, the other two are going to be standby. So we can put a star here, and effectively that guy is in charge of everything. So if you are connecting to the cluster, you'll connect to one of these API servers. You can connect to any of them. You hit that, the, uh, the controller manager and the scheduler do all the work inside the cluster, and one node is going to run that at any point in time. All the data is persisted to etcd. So etcd is just a distributed key value store. So the API server tier interacts with etcd. So if you create an object in Kubernetes, it saves off to etcd. That's, uh, that, that's how it stores information. Nothing interacts with etcd except for the API server. So any other processes that need to store something in persistence will go through the API server. So Kubernetes at its core is designed in a very Unix-like philosophy in that you have modular components that each do one job. So the API server feeds off an HTTP-based API. The uh, controller manager and the scheduler take care of all the work within the cluster. So those guys sit on the API servers, they inter or on the, the servers that are running the services, connect to the API servers, they all do that uh, typically through a local socket, and then the API servers interact with that CD for persistence. Nodes then exist down here, and we'll just call them N. And we can have as many nodes as we want. And the nodes are gonna hit the API server tier. And the nodes are going to say, hey, I'm here. There's a lot of authentication and client verification that can be done, um, all using TLS, so uh, public-private key pairs that are signed by both server and uh, client. So you can enforce at the API server level that nodes must authenticate with a uh, client cert. And at the API server level, you can say, present this as the server cert to the client. So client verifies authentic authenticity of the, uh, of the API server. API server gets validated by the client. And so that's kind of how the cluster is secured uh, from a network level standpoint. Within the cluster, there's a bunch of tools uh, that allow you to set privileges for interaction with API servers as well. Um, starting in uh, Kubernetes 1.8, we've got the role-based access controls. And that is... Uh, kind of king as, as far as granting and uh, dealing with permissions there. All Kubernetes per permissions are additive. You can't do revoke or deny. Uh, so you can only do grants. You can allocate um, inheritance, but you can't ever deny. So that's kind of a, one of the things we'll see implementation of the uh, role-based access controls. So the nodes then will run uh, a kubelet process, and the kubelet process does the interaction between the node and the API server. So that's going to say, hey, I'm here, uh, tell me what you want me to do. It's going to check in, and it will effectively watch for work to do. Um, they're also going to run the container engine. Docker is far and away the most common, but there's a lot of pluggable options. So they've uh, introduced and formed an abstraction layer that's common across container engines. So that is uh, basically going to allow for modularity when it comes to the actual container engine. So you can take Docker, you can run it out of the box. You can also say, we're going to use a, a CRI of our own, which is the container runtime interface, and we're going to implement something like container D using a, a CRI bridge. Or we can run CRIO, which those guys are more natively designed to interact with Kubernetes, uh, CRIO being the lowest level, but effectively just creates a bridge between a container runtime and Kubernetes, where Docker has a couple more shim layers in between to make it work. But they get the job done. And the key here is the modularity. 
So we can swap pieces in and out willy-nilly, and it all just kind of works because each piece has their job to do, and they do it. So the cube, the cube nodes will also run uh, the cube proxy process, which allows you to um, effectively route services in and out of the containers, um, and they'll also run a container network interface. So once again, that's completely modular. Um, there's a lot of providers out there that are basically plug and play. So you can create your cluster, and with the, uh, the newer versions of Kubernetes, you can actually deploy them as pods to run the services. So you would create your node, and you say, we're going to deploy the network as an actual Kubernetes object and ship it out that way. So that's kind of the high level of the infrastructure. Uh, the, the key takeaways here are everything's stored in etcd. The only thing that talks to etcd are the API servers, and everything else interacts with the API servers to both send and receive information. So does that make general sense to everybody? So what do we actually do with Kubernetes? So like I said a bit earlier, uh, one of the big goals of Kubernetes is to uh, simplify the operational overhead when you've got multiple nodes running containers. Uh, it also provides a lot of other benefits because you now have a common abstraction layer uh, across multiple services. So if you go to Google Cloud and you run Kubernetes, or you go to AWS and you run Kubernetes, or you go on-prem and run Kubernetes, you use the exact same objects to interact with the Kubernetes API as one to another. So that means that if you want to deploy a service to AWS and GCP, you can do the exact same service using the exact same containers and the exact same process across both nodes. Which that gets really handy for portability. And so let's, let's talk a little bit about what we can actually deploy to Kubernetes. So we know that it manages containers. So, Sorry, why don't you try and use a different one? Yeah. That one's not working. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if this one's a little better, but not much. There we go. Purple's, purple's a winner. <laughs> okay, so our goal is we want to ship containers, right? And that's great. So we want, let's say we want to run a web application. And so to run a web application, we need, uh, well, what do we need for a web application? Anyone? OK. All right, so we got a web server. Collateral. What's that? The collateral. OK. Collateral? Yes. He translated it properly. All right. So we've got a web server, we've got content, we've got a database, right? That's, that's enough to run a basic web server, right? right? So now let's break this down a little bit. So when we deploy a container, we don't say Kubernetes, go deploy a container. We say Kubernetes, go deploy a pod, which a pod is a set of containers. So if we start thinking about the concept of the web server, if we've got one web server, we've got one of each, right? That's pretty straightforward. If we go to two web servers, what do we need? Two of each and a load balancer? No, no. You, need a common back you need a common database. Right. And, and the content may need to replicate to both. Yep. So now, Cluster databases, what kind of? If we start doing this, even if we, even if we cluster the database, the, cl the database is going to be scaled separately from the web server and the content, right? Because if we want to create three copies, we can duplicate the web server, we can duplicate the content, and that's going to be happy. If we start duplicating the database as we duplicate this, then. You don't want to be selling those Tide Pods and, and, and <laughs> end up selling the same Tide Pod twice. Right, and we want to be able to take somebody's money and make sure that we ship the products out. 
So if we've got three copies of the database, which one's real? It's whichever one you hit, right? And then you go split brain, and then it's just a crapshoot as to what happens to your data. That is not what you want to do with the database. <laughs> so we want to scale the database separately from the web server and the content. This is how you start logically breaking down what goes into a pod. So we define a pod for the database, and we define a pod for the web server and content. As such, because we scale at the pod level, we can create three copies of this, and we can leave one copy of the database. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's how we define the concept of a pod. But once again, Kubernetes pod's a little low for us to be dealing with, because that means a lot of manipulation and a lot of management. So Kubernetes abstracts us away from that a little bit further. So we know the pod. We know we're going to run two containers in the web tier pod. One of them is going to run our web server. One of them is going to run our content. So in order to do that, we're going to define what we call a daemon set. Or, sorry, sorry, sorry. Not a daemon set. That's something different. Hold up, hold up, hold up. A deployment. Yeah, we've got four objects. Um, so we'll go through the, the deployment first. So we create a deployment, and underneath, and this is kind of transitive, but the deployment creates a replica set, which then creates pods. So we define a deployment, and that deployment is going to say, we want to deploy a web server. Our web server is going to have a web server in it and a content in it for our containers. The deployment then creates a replica set. Like I said, this is transient, so we don't actually have to do a whole lot here. And then we define what pods should be in that. So we're going to define our deployment as containing this guy, this guy. And this will also then say, here's our rules for batching and for scaling. So when we create our deployment, we can apply labels. Everything that Kubernetes does to associate objects between each other is done through labels. A label is simply a key value pair. Super simple. So when we create a deployment, we can give it a couple of labels. So we could say app is my web. And we can say version 1.0.0. .0 .0. So we're first stable release with whatever the heck that means today. Um, so we can now say, here's our labels. And labels are great because they can be used by just about every object in Kubernetes to associate different objects to each other. We define our deployment, and we can say create a pod. And by default, we can say create one replica, which is going to say, here's our pod definition. We've got one of these, one of these, there's a replica. Now, once we have a deployment out there, the deployment can be scaled. So we can uh, either change the actual YAML definition or JSON definition or do it through a Helm chart, but we can define explicitly in here, we want three replicas. Or via command line, we can say keep control, scale, deployment, the name of your deployment, and then a number of replicas. So you can say replicas equals three. What that's going to do is it's going to update etcd and say this should have three replicas. And then the scheduler looks at it and says, we've got one. It says we should only have one, and it's good to go. But then the controller manager comes along and says, hey, this deployment's updated. We've got one, and we're telling the scheduler we only need one. We actually need to tell the scheduler we need three. So the scheduler comes around the next time and says, hey, something's changed. Now the scheduler says, we've got one. We need three, so we're out of desired state. The scheduler then says, let's look at the nodes that are in the system. Let's look at any labels that are applied for requirements with where this can be applied to. So you could say something like, this deployment can only go onto nodes that have a label of 
includes fast storage. So you need SSD storage on it. You can apply n labels to your nodes and say, we have fast storage. So if that flag is set, then the deployment can go to it. So the scheduler does all that decision. So the scheduler says we've got one, we need three. These are the nodes that are eligible based on where we, uh, where we see the loads right now. This one and this one makes sense to put the nodes on. And then it updates that CD through the API. And then the kubelet says, hey, you have anything for me to do? Oh, I need to run new containers. And that, once again, goes through the API, determines what it needs to do, and then makes the work to, to adjust itself. So we can do both ways up and down in terms of scale. So we could say scale from one to three, we could scale from three to five, we could scale five to four, et cetera. And it works. We can specify a bunch of default policies with how to behave when we tell it to scale. By default, what it'll do is if we're in a good state to start, meaning we have three, we want three, we're in a good state. So if we say uh, update the deployment in any way, what it's gonna do is it's gonna get to the new desired state and then uh, basically make sure that anything that's old gets pruned. So this comes in really handy when we want to upgrade from version 1.0.0 to 1.0.1 because somebody pushed a bug in the application. So what happens here? We take version 1.0.0, we upgrade to version 1.0.1, we tell our deployment instead of going to 1.0.0, we go to 1.1. 1.0.1. So once again, the controller manager goes out, sees, hey, this changed, and says, we need to do this work. The scheduler then says, okay, I see what we need to do. Let's put these on these nodes. So it allocates the work. The workers then pick up the, uh, the workload that they're supposed to do, take care of it. And once all the new stuff is deployed and we start passing our health checks for the pods, then we tear the old one down. So effectively what we'll do is we'll start bringing 101 up. Now, one of the developers forgot to, uh, to disable some debug features and this thing went and blew through all its memory and it won't stay alive. So what happens, it brings this, it brings this up, 1.0.1, and they're not staying alive. Their health checks are failing. So it says, whoa, 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 this is bad we can't run this and let's 1.0.0 run without tearing 1.0.0 down. We then go in and we fix the issue. We deploy 1.0.2. This time it works, the health checks pass. So once 1.0.2 is rolled out, the health checks have passed, we kill 1.0.0. So this is all done automatically by the infrastructure of Kubernetes. That's where it really gives you some wins. So this talks about the deployment, which is something that will scale up willy-nilly and scale down willy-nilly because we want to add a couple web servers, what's the big deal, right? It doesn't really affect anything. Databases are a little bit different. We have to have rules about scaling. Uh, something like CockroachDB, yeah, you can play a little bit more in uh, Alex's scenario of let's just throw more containers at it and it'll play nice. But something more traditional like uh, MySQL database, which a lot of these guys are gonna be running behind the scenes. Not quite so easy. So what we wanna do here is we wanna create a stateful set. So, for all intents and purposes, stateful set is very similar to a deployment, except the, the fact that it tries to basically maintain state. So, rather than assuming we can go ahead and trash these and rebuild these as we want, it says we want to make sure that we hit a state and do everything we can to protect that state. So that becomes handy for stuff like the database. Now, we all like logs, right? Because logs help us track stuff down and debug stuff. So let's go in the scenario of we've got X number of servers and each of those servers, we want to capture the output at the Kubernetes level on the node and ship it to an Elk stack because, hey, it's free. It works well, it scales. So great solution. So how do we do that? Well, if we want to capture the logs off of each of the nodes, 
we should run something on each node, right? Because if we run it locally and watch the local logs, that makes it easy. So that introduces the daemon set. So a daemon set effectively says, run one on each node. So we don't have to specify and try to manipulate a deployment around with labels to say, run on every node and make sure that there's only one running on every node. The daemon set type does that by, by default. That's what it is. So once again, stateful set daemon set will create pods, but they all have a little bit different way of doing it. And then the last uh, kind of method of creating pods is jobs. So you can do um, either a base job type or a scheduled job type. Scheduled job effectively becomes a distributed cron engine. So you say, we want to run this guy at uh, 2 a.m. every day. We can create a scheduled job to do that. Once again, it's going to go, it's going to create the pods that are necessary to do the work, and then when it's done, it cleans itself up, but by default, jobs won't delete themselves. So that becomes really handy for viewing logs. So if a container deletes itself and trashes everything from the file system, you're not going to have any logs left. Uh, where with a job, it leaves itself there so that after the fact, you can go back in and see what was the actual output from this. Um, you can then do any kind of uh, debugging, and you can see uh, basically all your information, such as your exit codes and what actually happened during your run. A job is... Uh, and this is the prop job proper, uh, basically just a one-time run thing. So there's a lot of flags that you can add to these. So you could say, uh, here's the way you can handle failure. Here's the number of retries you can do. Um, here's what you should do in X case. And specify a lot of that default behavior. But that's, that's what a job would do for you. So if you have a one-time workload to run, throw it in a job. Uh, there's a little bit more complexity in terms of what you can do within a deployment, um, such as startup containers. So when you create the deployment, you can say, up front, we want to do this, basically, uh, legwork ahead of time, and then launch into our payload. So you can do that through the, uh, the init containers, and once it runs through the init containers, then basically you can just keep running with your workload. So there's a, a lot of... Uh, kind of additional functionality beyond that, but these are the primitives that effectively you'd work with to deploy a workload into Kubernetes. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's kind of a really high level crash course as to what Kubernetes is, how it does the things that it does. Um, so once we get this, it's great. We've got a bunch of containers out there running, but how do we access it? Right? Because you're not going to be able to uh, determine what your app is running based off of a random hash of, uh, of a container name, right? So if we've got a random string and we've got a guess, that's never going to work. Let's introduce a service. So once again, services play with labels. So when we define a service, we say, here is my service, and this service can be satisfied by any application that is running uh, version, we can do something like version major one. So we can say that this service is satisfied by app my web version major of one. And that's going to basically ensure that this service is fed by that deployment. That allows us some flexibility, and we wouldn't have to do this right away because we can ob modify these objects uh, as we go. But if we'd want to run version one and version two of our application simultaneously, we can ensure that this doesn't go to version two because version two has breaking changes. We don't want to impact the end user there. So we now map this service to this label and this label. Now note, we're not mapping a service to pods. We're not mapping a service to deployment directly. 
we're tagging the labels appropriately so that when it does the filter, this deployment satisfies this service. So the service then can be exposed uh, both to the cluster or to external clients to access it. So once we define and create the service, now we have a nice anchor point for the user to come in and get to our, uh, to our application. So the user goes to the service, which that can be an external load balancer in the cloud. It can be um, a node port on the actual uh, kubelet. Um, got a couple other options in there, but when the user comes into the service, now the service can go to a pod that's capable of servicing that request. So once we get to that, now we connect the user to a pod without any kind of hard coding or uh, anything that's going to be static because Kubernetes has all the primitives to be able to do that mapping for us. So this means that we now only have to define a couple things to be able to tie the service to the deployment that can service our work. We can tie a service to a stateful set or a daemon set. And when it maps into those, now we can say uh, create a service that goes to database MySQL, application my web app. And when we do that, now the pod that's under the deployment connects to the service, the service connects to the database, and then once again, everything is abstracted. So we can deploy this anywhere, we can deploy any number of them, and everything just kind of works because we do it all through the labels, and so long as we, we do our labeling properly, we can, uh, we can scale it. So you said that you, the, for, to have the database linked to the web server, you, you declare that in the service? Right, so you would create the service for the web app, mm -hmm. and then um, we create a second service that goes to labels on the database. Okay. And then w within your web app, you connect back to the service, okay. and that service maps you to the database. All right. So everything that you do effectively goes through a service uh -huh. when you come to the, the connectivity, if you're outside your pod. If you're inside the pod, all ports get mapped on 127.0.0.1. Yeah. So if you have a Redis server uh, and a web server, you just connect localhost to your Redis port, and then it can connect to that. If you have a centralized Redis server, then you would go to a service that points to your Redis server. So it all depends on how you, how you want to scale up, scale down, how you're using Redis. If you're using it as a local cache to the web server and want it to scale with the web servers, throw it in this pod. If you want to use it across your tier, throw it in a stateful set and map in a service to get to that. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. So that's, like I said, very high level, but it kind of gives you an idea of what Kubernetes does and uh, some of the primitives that it, it can use to do so. Yes. You should check an ingress in there. Yes. Um, okay. May I? Hold on. I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so you said that you can go that that one gets tricky because it sits above the service yes. and here you go. That yeah, one works. I'm gonna need the one that actually works, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So when you have an ingress, what you're actually doing is putting essentially an endpoint in front of whatever your service is, or creating an internal load balancer. So as you have a service, as he mentioned, node ports and load balancers. With various cloud providers, you can have a load balancer that either is like a GCP or an AWS, what, what do they call their elastic load balancer? Mm -hmm. Right? You can point those and have those point directly into your nodes. Or you know, your nodes actually have what they refer to as an ingress. And then you can actually map your static IP directly to your own nodes and manage it this way. So what you end up having is the user hits to your uh, ingress, which then routes to your services. 
And the important part about this one is when you have a, a web application, your ingress can actually control which sections go where. So you can have a service that actually services dynamic content and a service that actually services just static content and another service that services just the API. So if you have different behaviors that handle the interactions differently, you can have slash goes to your dynamic content. You can have slash static go over to a content that all it's doing is serving out of a CDN to get images, CSS, things like that, that are static. And then another one that has you know, slash static slash CDN that you actually is a 302 redirect automatically out to an external CDN for very large objects you don't want to be serving all the time. And then yet another one is as simple as controlling these routes and you can have three different versions of deployment controlling all of your individual APIs without having to have code that handles, okay, if they said this is a request for the API and it's version one, or version two, then I want to do it this way. But if it's version three, then the argument is changed. Your logic doesn't have to be that way anymore because ingress allows you to control that behavior. So if your API URLs are slash API slash three, you can go straight to a container that only knows about API version three. So you can actually get even more in control while you do all this. And from a static viewpoint, all of these interlinks, when it comes to your programming and your method of working, is actually done through DNS. So your, your code in your web server doesn't actually have to understand what a service is to be able to ask Kubernetes to find out where it's at. You just say, web server, I want you to connect to this database, and you say d-master.local, and it will go right through the service, and the services go, oh, that's that service, and that guy over there is the master database because it's got the tags. So as a programmer, there's nothing funny that you have to do inside of the cluster. And as a webmaster who used to set up, say, Nginx or AJ Proxy, and you would have manual load balancing routes, and you'd have to then have a VM that did this and this and this, you can still do the same thing but in a very simple definition, right here. So you get into the really complex deployments, and all you're doing is going, if it's API slash three, then I want you to go to the service that says that it's major version three at my web dash API. But, now how do you settle that? Completely unnecessary. You don't need an ingress. No, you don't need an ingress. You can directly attach your service through TCP to the internet. Or, like, like I said, if you're running a, uh, a web service, basically you can run uh, using the service type of external load balancer and basically just have your cloud load balancer do the work for you. It depends on the granularity that you want. And one other thing to kind of define a little bit more, when you define an ingress, you can run Nginx, you can run HAProxy, that kind of thing, but it effectively creates a lot of the boilerplate for you, so you only have to define the parts that you care about. Like, here is the route that I want to map to this service. Here is the route that I want to map to this service. And you can really, once again, take a couple steps back from the low-level stuff that system administrators have traditionally had to do. And that's, that, that's the big takeaway. This will do all the legwork that has been traditional for system administration in so many years and abstract away at least some of those problems. So yeah, it creates a couple others, but it takes away a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that's very difficult to do and makes it trivial in a lot of ways. How does file storage work for your database? So that would be done through a process of a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim. So like I said, we're just touching the surface here with, with these guys to deploy stuff. But to answer your question, 
what you would do is you define a persistent volume, which will go a PV here. Once again, we define labels here. So we can say this persistent volume is of type uh, S3. So uh, we make sure that it's S3. And we can say app, my app. And so we can say database requests a persistent volume with a tag of app my app. Beyond that, we don't care. It's not a high traffic database, so we don't care about performance so much. So it does that through a persistent volume claim. So we have our database gets a persi persistent volume claim which binds to a persistent volume. So once again, we can define here what the, what the requirements are for the persistent volume. Then we can define what the requirements are for the persistent volume claim. And then when the database makes the request to the persistent volume claim, it does the linking for you and binds out. And once again, you can specify a lot of stuff like, what do we do when the, when the database server goes away? Do we trash the data? Do we start over? Do we maintain the data? So for this case, what we want to do is have the, uh, the reclaim, reclaim policy of basically just leave it alone. Don't touch it. Because then when the next database server comes up to replace it, it can just pick up where it left off, grab the same persistent volume, and keep running. Okay. And once again, by abstracting this out, now, so long as our persistent volume is defined properly, it doesn't matter what this underlying storage is at all. So long as this database can get a claim, and that claim has a volume that can service it, this can change out. It can go to NFS. It can go to S3. It can go to Google Cloud Storage. Whatever we want to swap it out for, it doesn't matter. So long as we have that persistent volume. Okay. Which then, once again, if we want to run the same thing, in Google Cloud and AWS, we define the persistent volume slightly differently, but the rest of the stack stays exactly the same. Yeah, I'm trying to think outside of outside of all the RBAC objects, that's probably the bulk of the stuff that you deal with. No, I'm staying out of that. <laughs> but yeah, that's the the gist of it. And now you guys can all go home and deploy a web app. <laughs> it's that easy. Yeah? Yeah, it'll run on five. Not very well. It'll run. That's right. I can see lots of containers running on Raspberry Pi. And and just to kind of throw out when it comes to the container footprint, one of the big things that you see a difference between a VM and the container is memory footprint. And particularly with, what, with the Raspberry Pis, you're very constrained on memory. So doing something like that, you can run a lot more on a Pi by doing through containers. Uh, but on the other hand, you are going to choke out your processor real quick if you're pushing that hard. And any kind of I.O., uh, there's some restrictions there. but for just a general like playing around with stuff, it, it'll work. Container is going to be far less expensive than a virtual machine. Right? For sure. It, yeah, it absolutely. doesn't make it cheap. Right. If you add additional processes to a system, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether they're in a container or outside right. of a container. They it's more processes. resources, they yep. more processes. But, but it's only processes, whereas a virtual machine well, it's that it's many more processes and the hardware emulation. Right. And the so. reservation is hard. Yep. And yeah, right. Whereas a container consumes only what it actually needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can state, give me at least 100 megs, and then you can tell it through a pod definition, you're only allowed to have a yep. gig, and if you go over, I'm going to shoot you, and it will kill the pod. Yep. But if you had a VM that decided, you know, when you do this, you, go, you get 512 megs. I don't care if you use it, but you get 512 right. megs. And then on the host, that's 512 megs you can't use. Right. Yep. With containers and on the pod layouts, yep. you can say right. you get this much, and you're allowed to use up to that much, and then everybody else gets to fight over the leftovers. Yep. And yeah, you, you touched on two things here. You can give a reservation and a maximum. So reservation counts against what the node has on it. 
and you're just using Kubernetes to manage them much more yes. efficiently. Yes. yes. So, so we define, and, and like you said, you do it all through the, the container level. Fundam yeah. the, fundamental, the fundamental unit here is the container. Correct. And over top of that, what Kubernetes has built is an infrastructure for dynamically system administering and allocating them yep. on the fly mm -hmm. that that for people who are doing large HA systems makes it far easier. Yeah, and, and even for small systems, I'd argue that it still makes it easier because one thing, okay, so your common failure scenario, so let's, let's kill this. So we've got our three nodes running, and we've got a bunch of workloads here, but something catastrophic happens and the server detonates, right? So this server effectively disappears. Now he's not there. So now where Kubernetes really saves your butt is the, uh, the scheduler says, hey, wait a minute. We're supposed to have two of these running, and we only have one because one of them existed here. Or even worse, we're supposed to have one and we've got zero. Now the scheduler says, this guy is supposed to be running it, but he's not in a healthy state, so let's move it. And so the, the scheduler is gonna start it up over here instead. So um, effectively, it gives you a free layer of HA. So as machines come and go, the workload can kind of move around with it. Now, yeah. Kubernetes will not uh, preemptively go and kill machines to move them. So if it's running here, it's gonna stay running here until you evict it. But, if, but that's all, just kind of another added set of benefits that you get from the HA on Kubernetes. That's your very crash course on it. Awesome. Yeah.